Bible with Les Feldick. An Oklahoma rancher and farmer, Les Feldick has been teaching homestyle Bible classes for over 20 years in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. Les Feldick's unique style of Bible teaching has made the books of the Bible come to life. When Les is teaching, it's so interesting that people say time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. Okay, it's good to have everybody, and uh, I know that, as we mentioned in our last program, the weather hasn't been too commodious today, but we're glad you're here. And for those of you joining us on television, again, we just like to make it known we're an informal Bible study. We're not associated with anyone. I'm not a pastor. I'm not a reverend. I'm not a theologian. Please remember that. I'm, I'm just a layman, and I always like to use the analogy I'm more of a Sunday school teacher than anything else. And so... Uh, we just like to welcome you, and uh, we trust that you can feel like you're part of our class. Everything has been made available on videotapes, and all the tapes have been transcribed into the printed page. And so if you're interested in any of that material for your own home Bible study or for whatever, you just call us on the 800 number or you drop us a note, and we'll get these things to where you can have them and use them for we trust God's glory. All right, now we ran out of time in our last half half hour, which of course is quite obvious, but we're going to pick right up. I'm not going to skip anything. And we're going to go back a minute to start with 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And I, I have to do that because sometimes people will call and say, well, the program this morning, and I, now wait a minute, what, what program was that? And of course now Roy is putting the numbers on the board, that helps. But if people can just say, well, you started in 2 Corinthians 12, well, then that helps. So we're going to come back to 2 Corinthians 12 just for a jumping off. And then we're going to go back and look at our other references a moment. With regard to verse 2, where Paul says, I know a man in Christ, in other words, a true born-again believer, about or above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, whether out of the body I cannot tell, but God knoweth, such a one caught up to the third heaven. Well, I was in the process of showing how the scriptures lay out the first heaven, the second heaven, and this, the third heaven. And uh, we looked at the verse in Genesis in our last program. Now if you'll move with me up to Deuteronomy chapter 4, so that you can see from your own Bible that this is what the word does. It refers to the first heaven is the area where the birds fly, or what we call our atmosphere. <clears throat> but then the second heaven is the area of the stars, or what we would call space. All right, we have a good reference on that in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 19. And lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun and the moon and the stars, even all the host of what? Heaven. Now, that's not the heaven that we normally think of as the abode of God, but it is the second heaven. It's not the area where the birds fly, and it's certainly not the abode of God, so it's the second heaven. It's the area of space, the sun and the moon and the stars and what have you. And so now if you'll come back again to 2 Corinthians, now Paul is going to delineate the third heaven as being paradise. And again, we're going to chase down some scriptures. But for now, come back to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and going on into verse 3. And he says, I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not permitted or lawful for a man to utter or to repeat. All right, paradise. Now, we have to get an understanding of paradise in the Old Testament and the New Testament to realize that the apostle here is so in accord with all of Scripture. Now, I'm not going to take time to put on the board. I thought first I would. But you remember when we were teaching these things in the Old Testament, and you can be turning with me back to Matthew. <clears throat> Come on back to Matthew chapter 12. 
that we taught that in the Old Testament economy, since the atoning blood of Christ had not yet been shed, and animals' bloods could not atone for anyone's sin, all they did was covered it. So the Old Testament believer could not go up into the presence of God, so he went down into paradise. And we're going to show you now that this is the right direction to look at it as Christ is in his earthly ministry. And in Matthew 12, verse 39, or verse 38, they said, We would see a sign from thee. But he answered, verse 39, and said unto them, An evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it. But the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now here it comes. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights where? In the heart of the earth. Now that's down from here. And so everything concerning paradise in the Old Testament economy until after Christ's resurrection was down to this area in the center of the earth. All right, now we get another further description of it, a little window, if you might call it that, in Luke chapter 16. Luke 16. Luke chapter 16 and dropping down to verse 19. Now I'm sure you've all heard sermons on this, so I'm not showing you anything new, I'm positive. But we're going to go over it again because all of this helps us understand what Paul now teaches with regard to paradise compared to what it was in the Old Testament and during Christ's earthly ministry. Verse 19, there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus who was laid at the gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried and in hell. Now here we got to go to the board, don't we? In hell. Now, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, the word was Sheol. In the Greek, it was Hades, all meaning the same thing. And then in the English, it's hell. And all three of these words were simply the abode of those who had departed this life. Now, I've had so many people who go to churches that use the Apostles' Creed, I think it is, and they'll say, well, now, what does it mean when we repeat our creed? And it says that we believe that Jesus died, was buried, and descended into hell. You mean he went down into hellfire? No, he did not go into hellfire, but he did go down into the paradise side of hell. Now here it is in Luke chapter 16, what I'm talking about. Verse 23, in hell, Hades, Sheol, the place of the departed, he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, that is the rich man. And he seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Two believers, see? And here's the rich man in torment. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, so it must have been a Jew, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Verse 25, but Abraham... He too is in hell, but he's not in the torment side, he's on paradise side. Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receives your good things, and likewise Lazarus the evil, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldst send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they come into this place of torment. And Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. 
And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they will not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one raised, be raised from the dead. Now, the other account, I think, which is in Matthew, makes it so plain, and it's not in this one, that Abraham says, I can't come over to you and dip my finger in cold water because of what? A great gulf fixed. Now, all of these were in what we call Sheol and Hades or hell. They were all in the place that he parted. But on the one side was torment, and the other side was paradise. All right, now then, let's follow. And uh, come back with me now to Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll see what happened. And while you're looking for that, I'll remind you of another statement that Jesus made from the cross. And the thief that looked up to him and said, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. What was Jesus' answer? Today thou shalt be with me where? In paradise. See? Paradise. They'd go down and join the saints that were waiting for this great work of atonement. Now, since the atoning blood had been shed, and Christ has died, and he has spent these three days and three nights in paradise, not in torment, but he's been in paradise. Now look what Paul says happened. Verse 8 of Ephesians 4. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, that is, after his resurrection, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. Well, now, who had been in captivity? Those believing Old Testament saints. They were held in Hades or hell or Sheol on paradise side, waiting for the atoning blood, which had now been shed. And so now when Christ left paradise, look what happened. Verse 9, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also, what? descended first, before he ascended, he descended first into the lower parts of the earth. See how that fits with Matthew 12? Remember what that said? As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so also must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. All right. Now, Paul puts the capstone on it that before he ascended to glory, he descended into paradise and took those who were captive. And now then go on in verse 10. So he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens. In other words, into the heaven of the heaven, the third heaven, <clears throat> that he might fill or fulfill all things. All right, now then if you'll come back with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now when Paul says that he went up to paradise, you see, this is confirmation of the fact that paradise is no longer down as it was, but now it's in glory. In fact, you're in 2 Corinthians. I'm going to go back a couple more pages to where we were, oh, I don't know, several programs back. It was chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, coming down to verse 8. And here is the lot of the present-day believer when they die. Has been now ever since Christ ascended. Verse 8 of 2 Corinthians 5, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now, if he's going to be present with the Lord, where is he hoping to go? Paradise. Because paradise is now in heaven as we understand heaven. You got that? All right, now then, if you'll come back with me to chapter 12. <clears throat> Paul has now gotten a glimpse of heaven as we normally think of it, with all of its beauty, and no doubt with all of the music. Now, I love music, good music, 
And I think that when we hear good music down below, it's just a sampling. It's just a sampling of what we're going to experience when we get to glory. All right, now Paul evidently had a full exposure to all this. He saw the glories. He heard the magnificent things. You got it in verse 4? How that he was caught up into paradise, that is, into the third heaven, remember? And heard unspeakable words, which it is not permitted or lawful for a man to utter. In other words, God said, all right, Paul, I'm letting you see and hear, but you can't repeat it. You have to keep it to yourself. All right, now verse 5. Of such a one would I glory. Yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. I'm not going to be foolish, remembering what God had instructed. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth. What's he saying? If God would have permitted him to repeat what he had seen and heard, what would the human race have done with the Apostle Paul? They'd have worshipped him. And see, Paul is just as human as you and I. He does never, never does he expect worship from any of his converts. He's not God. And so this is the, one of the failures of mankind. And I'm sure this is why the ark, Noah's ark, has never been discovered. Because you know what would happen. If they could uncover that thing, there'd be a, like all roads lead to Rome, they would all lead to the ark. And the world would flock to worship something like that. And same way with many other things that God has seen fit to keep hidden because knowing the human heart. Well, if Paul could have rehearsed with any of his people, or even to the Roman world in general, of what he had seen and heard, they would have fallen down and worshipped him. And see, God couldn't permit that. And so he put the stigma on him, you cannot repeat what you've seen and heard. Now, again, this happened 14 years back from where we are, which, remember, I put you back into the probably the early 50s, early in his uh, missionary career. Now put all this together. Whenever the man was going through intense suffering, as he was leaned over the stake and they were whipping him, first from the front and then from the back, what do you suppose was constantly sustaining him? What he saw and heard in glory. And on top of that, how many times the Lord Jesus appeared unto him, like at Corinth, when the Lord said, don't give up, Paul. I have a great number of people in this place. You remember when they were about to be shipwrecked on that trip to Rome, and uh, a lot of the prisoners and everything were about to be put to death because they didn't want to escape? And Paul just brought everything under control, and he said, look, he said, God has appeared to me. Not a life is going to be lost. Well, how did you know? The Lord Jesus had communicated with him. And so he had these things of the supernatural to compensate for all of his trials and all of his sufferings. Now, you and I don't have that, but he did. And so whenever he would come through <clears throat> these beatings, he could just remind himself, but look what I've got coming. Let's go back Romans. I hope we've got time now this time. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And drop down to verse 18. Now remember, this is all written quite a while after. The Romans is probably written about 60 A.D., so this is uh, at least 10 years after he's had this experience of getting a glimpse of glory. And so now look how he could write with full understanding, even though it's inspired by the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, he says, For I reckon, Romans 8, verse 18, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time. See how plain that is now? I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the, what's the next word? The glory 
that's going to be revealed to us. Oh, you know, believers just can't seem to get that through their head. That even though we may shun a lot of the world's pleasure and, and we may not enjoy some of the things that the world thinks are enjoyable, is it worth it? Well, you better believe it. You better believe it because no matter what we suffer, even if we would suffer to the extent that the Apostle Paul suffered, we would still with him be able to say, oh, but it's worth it because of the glory that's waiting for us. And it's not just going to be 70 years to compensate for 70 or 80 or 90 down here. It's forever. It's forever. Some pastor out in the audience sent me a chart that he had made. And... Uh, full agreement with everything that I've been teaching. But I wrote back and I told him, I said, you know the part that excited me the most? Because at the way right end of the chart, it was eternity. Ages upon ages upon ages upon ages. Think about it. That's eternity. Time without end. See? And so we with the apostle have to do the same thing. Maybe we'll have to suffer yet someday. We don't know, but if we do, that's what has to bear us up, is that no matter how much we suffer, it's going to be worth it all because of the glory that's going to be revealed to us someday. All right, now the other one I think we can use is in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And remember, this is all written long after this tremendous experience. And I'm not taking away any of the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I feel every word in this book is Holy Spirit breathed. But remember that as men wrote, their personality, their personal feelings were also evident. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and drop again at verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. But as it is written... I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. What a promise. And God can't lie. And so we can rest on it that the day is coming we're going to experience things like, well, I think Paul was just bursting back here in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Oh, how he would like to have shared at least some of it. But uh, he couldn't, all right? And that's the reason, of course, is that they would begin to worship him. All right, now if you'll in the last couple minutes come back with me again to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Reading on in verse 7. No, 6, I'm sorry. 2 Corinthians 12, beginning at verse 6. For though I would desire to glory. See how he's just bursting to tell us what he saw and heard. I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth. In other words, like I've already said, the danger was that they would exalt him. And like the pagans would do with their gods and goddesses, you know, they'd be having statues of him and they'd have idols fashioned after him. God couldn't have that. All right. Now verse 7. To make sure, to make sure that he never forgot, what does God do? Gives him a thorn in the flesh. Verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation. See how plain that is when you know now what he's talking about? What was the abundance of revelations? Well, first, the revelations of these doctrines of grace, the gospel and the church age teachings. That was enough. But on top of that, he got a glimpse of glory, a revelation. And the man is bursting with all this. And yet God says, I don't want you to be exalted. I don't want you to get the big head. I don't want you to get proud. And so I'm going to give you a thorn in the flesh to keep you humble. All right? So lest I should be exalted, verse 7 again, through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. The messenger or the angel of Satan to buffet or to attack him, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now, 
the Greek makes it so much stronger. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, but a few of these verses I go back and, and do uh, a little study on it. You know what he's calling here, this thorn in the flesh? It was like being crucified. It was that kind of a constant pain. It was as if he was constantly suffering crucifixion. That's what the Greek implies. I, I copied down a, another translation, and I didn't get it along, and I don't want to try to uh, quote it without reading it accurately. But uh, one, of the, one of the translations put it that way, that in order to keep him humble, the Lord had actually given him a thorn in the flesh that was like an impalement. Well, that's what crucifixion was, you see. It was like an impalement that he had to live with, and he's already had it over 14 years, and we have to assume he probably carried it to his death. Now, there's a lot of controversy from various points of view as to what his thorn in the flesh was. Uh, some of them are absurd, and some of them make some sense, but the one that I've always adhered to and I still stand on, I think he had what we would probably call a vicious case of pink eye, ophthalmia. And it was very common in the ancient world. Of course, they didn't have the antibiotics and so forth, and it would lead to his repulsive appearance, those uh, <coughs> mattery eyes, and uh, it affected his eyesight to the point, in fact, let's hurriedly look at Galatians, and you'll see where I get my, my thinking. In Galatians chapter 4, We'll be coming to all this before too long in our next study of Galatians. But Galatians 4, verse 15, he says, Where is then the blessedness you spoke of? For I bear you record that if it were possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Well, why would they want to give him their eyes if he didn't have a need for it? All right, and then the next one, I think I've still got time for it, in the very last verses of the book of Galatians. And in verse 11, and he says, you see how in what large print I have written unto you with my own hand. Who uses large print? Blind people. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a weekly Bible study. If you would like more information about the Les Feldick Ministries, a Bible study in your area, or about this program, write to Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. That's Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Through the Bible with Les Feldick is viewer supported, and your gift is appreciated. Thank you. And be sure to tune in next time for Through the Bible with Les Feldick.